at this early at this <laughs> early relatively early hour on president's day um, my name is Oliver Gorf and I'm the director of Brutet Zentrum Atlanta and I'm very glad to welcome today um, Miriam Fisaya from Berlin who will give us a very interesting insight into a black life I would say in Berlin but also about her own business that um, specializes on traveling while black in Berlin. Uh, we will hear a lot of about the history of Black Life Anyway in Berlin, but then also, of course, about the present and the circumstances under which um, she operates in Berlin. I also want to welcome Onyx Henry, who is the project manager of our good series Black Life in Germany and who organized really everything. <laughs> Most of this here and all the upcoming events. Um, I wanna make it short on my side, but I want to use the opportunity to have you all here to make you aware of another very special event inside our Black Life in Germany series. And that will be on the 8th and the 9th of March at 8 p.m. We will have um, a, a theater group and a performance group from Hamburg, Germany in the house at Push Push Arts in um, College Park. And the theater group is called Formation Now. It's a theater collective that combines, as they say, empowerment with a lot of fun and put a focus <laughs> on the perspectives of BIPOC, so of um, Black people and people of color. Um, they themselves are all women, which is fitting since the premiere will be on the International Women's Day. And they are all almost uh, all black or color people of color, being German or live, having lived in Germany for a long time, including the director, Mabel Preach, who has just been nominated for the German theater or Oscar, the Faust Award. Um, so the title of that play will be Am Ende der Revolution, at the end of the revolution. And it will actually have its world premiere in Atlanta which I think is fitting, presents a poetic and musical journey from the past to the future of the black movement in Germany and locates its place in the context of black movements in the US and the world. And I'm very excited to have them here on the 8th and the 9th of March. Another thing coming up in March is our big Goethe Frühlingsfest on March 18th, that's a Saturday from 12 to 6 p.m. and an after show with a huge band um, from 6 to 8 p.m. We are expecting about 10,000 guests at this German-style arts street festival. Um, it's an annual thing, so some of you might have seen it already. Um, so March 18, come to Avondale Estates and let's celebrate with our families there. Um, there will be German old cars ex um, exhibited and German new cars, electric vehicles from, I don't know, Porsche, Mercedes-Benz, etc. We are also um, very much looking forward to a ton of very good music there, live music. So that's kind of my plugs. As always, you're always happy about donors. We are basically donor financed. We get only a little bit of money from the German government. And we are dependent on as they say on NPR, listeners like you. <laughs> um, but no, with no further ado, I now give the microphone to Onyx, Henry, and then after that to Miriam, our actual star of the night, Onyx. Thank you, Oliver. Good morning to the stateside and good Abend to our presenter, Miriam, and whoever else may be in Germany and elsewhere abroad. Thank you all for joining us for today's talk, which is a part 
of the Goethe Centrum Atlanta's ongoing Black Life in German, Germany series. Our last event was a presentation that highlighted one of the ways Berlin-based anti-racism activists have been tackling the present day visibility of Germany's colonial legacy. If you weren't able to attend, but would like to learn more, you can find the recording on the Goethe Center from Atlanta's YouTube page or by searching for fighting German colonialism in the streets of Berlin on YouTube. And I'll type that into the chat afterwards. The aspect of Black life in Germany that we'll explore today in Traveling While Black, uncovering Berlin's hidden Black history, is how Black people take up space in Germany, both physically and in German history. German history, I'm sure many of you would agree, is quite whitewashed. Miriam's interest in unearthing and telling Black stories was ignited during her school days, I recently learned, as a direct result of this educational lack. And this talk is also um, put together because if you are the type of person who has never needed to consider how racist a place is and to make plans accordingly, then you should know that that is something that you can, that you should consider a privilege. Miriam's passion for creating tours and offering travel advice through a Black lens stems from her personal experiences as a Black German and a traveler. Her travel business, Sudi, skillful, skillfully addresses these historical and practical concerns. If you have any questions during her presentation, please type them into the chat, um, direct message them to me or to Oliver. Um, how you do that is that you change where it says to. Right now, it probably says everyone for everyone. Um, you would just click on that, click on my name, Onyx Henry, or you could type on or click on Oliver Gorf, and we will see those questions and be able to field them to Miriam after her presentation. So um, with all of that being said, please help me welcome Miriam, and thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Onyx, and thank you, Goethe Institute Atlanta, for inviting me um, while um, like celebrating Black History this month. So it's quite exciting for me. And I will start now with a short, um, let's say, um, questions on Mentimeta. And you will need your uh, phone for that. Um, I will just share it with you and then probably it will take five minutes. So take your time. You have to uh, go to mentimeter.com and um, add the code 2199-2135 and then the question will pop up hopefully when the internet is working well and also um, I hope it works. It working? All right. So my first question to you is, I, I was not sure what kind of audience I will have today, but my first question was, do you research how welcoming a destination is to Black people before traveling? Because that was the case for me, even within Germany, when I, um, I was traveling or when I was going to a university and we we had to let's get, go to east part of Germany for example I was doing research <laughs> because first of all I was scared and second I thought about okay how will pe people perceive me what kind of um, feeling I will have in that destination how, am I welcoming and um, is it safe for me so that's what I always do actually the first thing I will do when I travel to a place is actually uh, doing research um, if it's safe and if I will find Black communities, Black history. Um, so that way, that, the first question would be that. Uh, if you're done, then I will go to the next question. This is, of course, broad. Um, do you find experiences that reflect your identity in Europe while traveling? Because, of course, your identity can be, um, yeah, 
different, right? You don't have to be black. People are diverse. So, um, what kind of what kind of experience do you have when you travel to Europe? Because I know for sure that a lot of um, Americans come to Germany to um, experience their own history, because many Germans also uh, migrated to US, right? Um, because this question, for example, was personal for me. Uh, when I was traveling within Europe with my family, I didn't really find experiences that reflected um, my identity or I didn't really see uh, people like me. And <laughs> sometimes it was quite weird for us as a family, because first of all, we, are, we were the only black family. And second, um, yeah, every tour that we booked or history tours was basically about, um, yeah, the majority. So you feel somehow awkward. And if you ask, okay, do black people exist here? Mostly it's like, oh, we don't know. And um, yeah, migrants. <laughs> but of course, even migrants have their own history and connection to a, to a place um, and yes yeah, somehow we do we did have to somehow do our own research and uh, let's see the second question would be um, do you feel you can find black history or tours that you can experience while traveling to Germany because I didn't <laughs> Besides, of course, um, Die Koloniale, and they do tours in Berlin, and I also work with them. So, yeah. All right, and then this is the, like, I will have another question, but this is, I think, hopefully, some of you will answer it correctly. How many Afro-Germans exist in Germany? <laughs> I will answer this question later. Oh, wow, 10 million. All right. <laughs> okay, then to the last question would be, who believes there were black knights in the medieval age? in Europe or also in Germany. And um, what do you think this, I mean, let's say, do you think this film has a connection to Germany? All right, 50-50, <laughs> interesting. I'll answer that question as well. Uh, I'll just wait maybe a little bit since not all of you answered the question yet. All right, <laughs> then I will start with my main presentation. Um, okay. All right, now to uh, my main presentation. Um, yeah, I have a company since two and a half years now and the name of the company is Sodi. Um, and I, my intention with the company is I would like to build bridges with, within travel experiences from, let's say, 
within Germany, but also around the world that would like to connect Afro diaspora community. And short, let's say intro about me. Um, thank you, Onyx, already you introduced me. My name is Miriam Fasahe. I am actually a digital marketing manager and work um, at Visit Berlin. So I do market Berlin. And at the same time, um, it's my passion to let's say give space to the Afro diaspora community in Berlin. And uh, to answer your, let's say the last question I um, asked you is uh, yes, there were black knights in, in the medi medieval period, medieval area. And one of them was Maurice from Magdeburg in Germany. And this is last year with my friend. Um, <laughs> and it was quite nice actually to, uh, to um, find the church in Magdeburg. Uh, we went together because there was a possibility to experience Germany with um, the nine euro ticket. So um, it was quite exciting to Miriam? find. Yeah. So, can, kannst du einmal unsharen und wieder neu sharen? Wir haben wieder dasselbe. Yeah, you know. Oh. So we just have a little te technical because we're missing, but it's going to be back. We have the same thing in the prep already. So. Okay. What did you see and what did you? What it was just the, the survey was the last thing. If the you, survey was the last thing. Oh, yeah. right. Okay, then I will do it again. You know. What about now? Yeah, perfect. Sorry. No, it's fine. Then again, so uh, this is my company name, Zodi. And my intention with the company was, like I already said, to build bridges within travel experiences. As you can see, the logo, um, I wanted to, to like build connection to an African continent as well, and named my company also after my grandmother. Uh, her name was Zodi. And as you can see, also the hairstyle is quite East African, which is from Eritrea, Ethiopia, which my background is from. So yeah, that's my company. And that's me in Berlin. <laughs> and uh, I chose this picture because I work actually for Visit Berlin in digital marketing and I do market Berlin somehow internationally for conventions. Uh, but the, at the same time, in my uh, let's say, as in my hobby, I um, I try to give space to the Afro diaspora community in Berlin. And to your, <laughs> I, I said that already. But to, to my last question to you, um, yes, um, let's say um, Black Knights existed in Europe, and one of them was Maurice from Magdeburg. As you can see, that was last year with my friend uh, in Magdeburg. We went there because we had the possibility to um, to use the nine euro ticket and travel around Germany for yeah nine euro. <laughs> so we did that and uh, found a church, which was quite interesting actually. So a lot of people also didn't know about it. And when I found out the first time, I was quite uh, happy because I realized, wow, okay, even Germany had a black knight. <laughs> I hope you can see that. You can see that? Yeah. Yes, no? Okay, all right. All right. I hope you can see that as well. Um, so like I, I already mentioned, um, growing up, I um, really struggled to find Black history in Germany. So I grew up in Frankfurt am Main, and um, we definitely had, um, let's say, history classes, and I was quite interested about, and we also had, let's say, um, uh, Jewish Americans, actually, also, who came to, um, uh, to Frankfurt because Germany had, like Frankfurt had a huge um, Jewish community and, um, um, and their family members like died in Auschwitz and they came back to have somehow like, um, let's say, Wiedergutmachung. Uh, and um, I even asked them like, oh, okay, did at that time exist black people and they were not so sure and couldn't answer me. So I was like, okay, just do your own research. 
<laughs> so when I did my own research, I was quite surprised that Black, oh, okay, I showed uh, more recent one from Magdeburg already. Um, but the Black history in Germany was quite um, old and um, the history was very diverse and complex. And it was uh, really touching to know more about um, all these in individuals who also created um, history and also um, somehow influenced uh, the German society. Um, so yeah, that was really, really nice. And I thought this shouldn't be, I mean, I shouldn't be alone that know this. I should definitely also share it with my community or let's say with other people, everybody. Um, but at the same time, while um, traveling with my family, but also uh, working in the travel industry, I found um, that travel experiences um, is defined, of course, um, intersectionally by race, religion, class, and power relation. So it also depends what kind of, um, even let's say if you are a black person, um, it depends also what kind of um, class you have, what kind of power you have to, let's say, experience um, different cultures. So um, of course, not everybody can afford uh, traveling, right? But within also traveling, um, I could definitely experience like, oh, okay, there is definitely a huge imbalance within travel and people who, let's say, um, like tell us about how amazing the world is. It's mostly uh, quite, um, yeah, through this imbalance um, power that is, let's say, so it's not really um, like everything that we see is not really how it is. That's what I wanted actually to say. Um, um, and it was also quite difficult to me, like, like I already mentioned, to, uh, to experience um, countries, but also within Europe, um, um, not only that reflected my identity, but also to gain um, more information about um, them individuals, even though I, I let's say, saw some um, images like that, for example, nobody could tell me who that person was. So it was really, really difficult um, to gain information about these individuals who lived in Europe for several generations. Um, and that was, um, by the way, in Milano in last year, there was an exhibition about um, black Italians in the 15th, 16th century. Uh, yeah, like we, like I already said, I work in the travel industry and uh, as we all know, Europe is the most popular tourism destination in the world. And of course, the main reason that Europe is so pure, popular in the world is um, it has diverse landscape, but it's it has culture and architecture. And it's quite fascinating for Americans, but also around the world. Um, but the significant asset is actually the history and the culture. Um, but which, uh, but this culture is is heavily influenced by imperial power, migration, trading, and exploitation, and you can see that not only in Germany but also in Europe, all over, like Europe, Italy, for example. Um, I could find out that uh, tomato, for example, is not even from Europe. It's actually from South America. <laughs> and it was quite interesting to find out that in Italy, it was actually forbidden. So nobody should eat it in the 15th century. And it started to be like cultural uh, normal in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, but if we think about let's say tomato, we think about Italy, but it's not even from Italy, it's actually from South America. And at the same with pasta and everything that we actually think is European, it's actually not. Um, and it's it's somehow, I find it quite sad that um, all the histories, it's somehow like it's been erased. And, um, and then at the same time, the uh, past is quite idolized and that's what we, um, let's say, consume as a traveler. And then all the BIPOC, um, let's say, individuals who, let's say, influence the, the continent, um, nobody knows them. 
Um, yeah, I mentioned that already. So, and that why travelers, they consume one-sided experience and then they also um, reproduce it on social media and everybody wants to consume the same thing. And this is mostly also quite um, like white dominant um, groups that also, I mean, now it's changing, of course, um, but when you see the historical experience and so on, it's most, mostly actually the same. So I thought like, okay, do your own research <laughs> and you will definitely find something. And I did really actually found a lot. And um, even in last, last year, I went to uh, um, Warsaw, for example, to Poland. And I found out that there was a, um, um, let's say, um, Polish Nigerian soldier who um, used to live in Poland um, before Second World War. And he um, was one of the resistance and he fought um, and he was quite fam famous in Poland. And I was like, wow, okay, that's insane. Why is it not so well known? Um, and I, when I saw that, I felt like, okay, I, I am safe in Warsaw because for me, Warsaw, especially for us who grew up in Germany, Poland, like East Europe, it's like, oh my gosh, is it safe for black people? And I was also surprised when I shared um, my um, story on Instagram. Um, a lot of my friends told me, okay, then if you're going, I'll definitely go as well. And I was also surprised that they even had an African um, um, festival in Poland. And that surprised me as well. Um, and it was really a nice experience. Um, yeah, so, so we come with the problem. Um, of course, I am uh, privileged enough to travel around Europe and to also gain my own experience. Uh, but not every uh, person in, let's say, let's say within the Afro diaspora community in Germany, most of the people are like Hannah, um, including me. I belong to the one million Afro diaspora community in, in Germany, and most of them feel neglected by the travel industry. And according to the Afro census, that was, um, let's say, um, a it was um, like a, a census that was made in 2020 and 85% of Afro Germans um, said they experienced race-based discrimination in their leisure time. And to be honest, I was quite surprised that 85 is quite a lot. And sometimes I also ask on Instagram, um, for example, if they experience um, um, race-based discrimination at the airport. And I got a lot of message that was also really, really sad. Um, and as you also can see, um, um, I would say, I mean, I don't really like assume, but um, it's also I like within the Afro diaspora community, not everybody is also in the position and has money to travel. So it's also quite difficult for many just to travel even around Europe. Um, so what I thought was like, okay, why can't you create uh, experiences, first of all, that reflect your identity, which is also Hannah's identity, and um, also creating leisure time in Berlin and also in Germany that doesn't, first of all, cost much, that is affordable, and that also gives people safe space. Um, so that's what I thought. And it was <laughs> during Corona time that I actually thought I should definitely do it because I realized a lot of people were also, um, didn't know what to do. They were scared because they were like, okay, can I go to East part of Germany? Because yeah, it was a curfew and people were asking me like, what can I do in Germany? What can I do in Berlin? And I was like, okay, just do your own experience because they are not. So I started to organize a black bike tour, post-colonial walking tour that I also uh, did with the Coloniale um, yoga course. And, and that was quite nice because a lot of people were quite happy. I just didn't really have so much time. <laughs> so I had to find a way uh, to put everything in place that um, 
that my clients are happy and I will not be overloaded with work. So this is one of the um, tours in African Quarter, Mamboro. Um, I heard you actually also had a collaboration with them. Um, this is one of the tours last year. Um, I hope you can see the video. You can? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay. I know it's always a bit weird to talk into the void, but <laughs> okay. you do pretty well. We see everything, I think. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the, then the next slide. Uh, this is for one of the museum tours that I um, do. So I basically do the tour by myself. This uh, museum is the first, um, let's say, permanent museum that is dedicated to colonialism, racism, and Black resistance in Berlin. And this museum is quite um, important for Berlin, I would say, uh, because uh, in Tripto, uh, the first um, colonial exhibition took place. It was 126 years ago and uh, 102 individuals were exhibited like in a zoo. And um, the I mean, the place is now a, a park. It was a park in the past as well. And um, this museum is dedicated to the people who, let's say, were exhibited in Berlin. Um, and after the exhibition, 21 of them stayed. And one of them, actually plenty of them, also like from the 21, um, they also did um, career. So one of them even became a first black uh, train uh, driver in Germany. Um, and this is the yoga workshop that I organized with a Jamaican yoga teacher um that also has a connection to african continent and this is my uh black joy bike parade that i organized last year um i started it two and a half years ago it was first it's more like a black history black sorry black bike history tour and then I thought to myself last year, because um, two years ago, I had way too many people and I had to somehow um, organize it with my boyfriend. And that was quite intense. So I, I thought like I should make it bigger. So this one was the biggest one. Over 50 people joined and we had police protection. And this is basically my secret sauce. So my uh, reviews that I got from my uh, clients. Um, and it was quite also nice to get, um, let's say reviews that, um, that was the first tour by the way. <laughs> and you can also see here, I don't know why she was looking at us that way. <laughs> I guess that was, uh, Karen in Berlin. <laughs> and this is the, the decolonial tour. That was the bike tour that I mentioned last year. And this was this week. All right, now I think that I was a bit too fast, right? I will show you the video from last year. Enjoy.
was it. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. <laughs> it was not way Thank too fast. No, no, you're good. You're good. Okay. Time is, is a construct. So okay. thank you, Miriam. Thank you so much for your presentation. <laughs> okay. I have a question just to get the ball rolling. And since you ended on this note, we'll start the questions on this note. Um, the Black Joy Bike Parade, I know we talked a little bit more in, in depth one-on-one -on -one about this. And yeah. it was fascinating to me to hear about, you know, just kind of more about your inspiration, the process of creating it, your expectations of participation versus the reality of it, um, what the reactions were that you had from, from the participants, whether or not you saw any more Karens along the way making <laughs> similar faces. I would love to have you say more about that. Uh, so the thing was, um... I mean, Berliners love their bikes, and um, <laughs> and I thought um, so. Normally, we let's say we meet each other mostly when it's a demonstration, when someone died, or um, mostly like when something bad happens. And I wanted to have somehow um, an event which is um, accessible to everybody, um, like age-wise, that everybody can participate where you can do an activity that is like, like, where it's like active and that can motivate people also to, um, yeah, to learn more about Berlin and to see Berlin in a different way and to experience Berlin also in a positive way. And even with the police protection, I, my intention was actually, hey, of course we have really bad experience with police, but this is what's okay. Hey, look, police are police officers are protecting us so that you can have fun, so you can enjoy and take space and show Berlin that we do exist. And it was amazing. Uh, mostly what actually um, also gave me a lot of reward was actually from kids. So one of the mothers came to me after the end and she was like, my, I never saw my child so happy and we can't wait to participate next year. <laughs> and some of the participants asked me like, are you doing it this year again? I was like, I don't have time, but I'll do it next year. And I met uh, one of the participants this week as well. And she told me, uh, you will do it this year, right? Because I can't wait. That was the best thing I, um, I ever did in Berlin. I was like, wow, okay, that's, that means something. So um, I had a lot of positive um, feedback from people that participate. And that was really amazing. Yeah, I think that's really um, to your point of being really touched by, you know, seeing as many kids as you did that to me is incredible, right? Because it, those kinds of experiences, like the, the having experiences with racism, like it starts really early, but then so too does building self-esteem, right? And so I think that that's really powerful for you to be able to create an event where they can see themselves, like be surrounded by images of themselves in an environment that is not reacting to something negative. I think it's beautiful. Um, there was a question, I, I posted just now um, two things, the link that I said I would post earlier and did not, um, mm -hmm. to the talk that we had in November that also Miriam mentioned um, Berlin Postcolonial, having a connection to them, that's the same group. Um, I also posted into the chat a link to the Afro Census, the um, Afro Census that happened almost three years ago now, um, mm -hmm. because there was a question about whether or not there was a map that kind of um, could visualize for us where there are um, concentrations of Black populations in Germany. I mm -hmm. don't know of such a map myself, but I think that if there were going to be one or a description of where there are um, groups of us, uh, uh, groups of Black people in Germany, that uh, it pro probably would be found there. Um, off the top of my head, I know Hamburg and Berlin probably also Frankfurt on Main, there are very large um, populations of Afro-Germans and other black people in those three mm -hmm. cities, three major mm -hmm. cities for sure. Yeah. Um, another question that has come up, um, Nikki is going to be in Germany next month. 
And she would like to know whether or not she could schedule a tour with you. So kind of, I guess, like a, a more broad question is about how often do you offer the tours at this point? Because I know that you said that at least with the Berlin, with the Black Joy Bike Parade, that the demand or the 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 work that goes into putting that on can be a bit much. So I know that, you know, you might not have bike tours as often as you did before. So what does that look like now? So, yeah, basically, because I have like a full time job, it's quite difficult to like manage a bike tour. So the um, Black, jo Black Joy Bike Parade, I will do it once per year. Um, but I have other tours like the walking tours, the um, um, the museum tours that I organize once per month, that one I can definitely also organize it spontaneously um, after work as well. Um, and I'm also planning to create other tours. So I'm also trying to maybe um, have someone who can work with me as well. So yeah, she can definitely connect and ask me and I will definitely um, assist her. As awesome. far as I can. Yeah. Would they be able to find you at sudi.de, sudi.com? Yeah, let me just. Okay. So cool. I yeah. think that there was probably more than just one person interested. <laughs> um, a follow up question to the parade uh, Are there non Black participants? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it was the intention was, of course, to uh, have. Um, to create an event for black people, but it doesn't mean, I mean, it was open. There were like mixed race families and everybody that also want to um, contribute. And um, it was yeah, it was more about like, okay, giving space. So and everybody who thinks mm -hmm. want to participate can participate. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. A more personal question that is not related to the parade. Have you done this kind of work before or would you be interested in like consulting with, um, I guess like it, like educational organizations, colleges um, to provide um, those kinds of like group experiences for like college kids or, you know, school aged kids? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, I already, I mean, um, I, uh, when I was a student, I used to work for an NGO called Africa Media Centrum, okay. and we did that kind of work. So we were in schools and we also um, organized tours to Africa, Africa, and Shafiata. We did a course about anti-racism and so on. It was quite intense, um, mm -hmm. but we did that as well. But that was like part of my part-time job as a student. Okay. And my intention is actually with, with my work now, and I hope it will um, work out uh, to um, to work in, um, let's say, um, um, in, in institutions. So mm -hmm. somehow to set a change on, based on institute, because I realized, um, for example, at the airport, a lot of people like get a lot of discrimination in Germany. Mm -hmm. And um, there was even an incident last year at a World Health Summit where some uh, like one doctor, I guess, he was from West African country, I guess. Um, I forgot his name now, but they didn't allow him to enter the country because they thought he would like to stay there somehow. And it was like a public statement on Twitter and it was really like, it went viral. And um, when that went viral and I asked on Instagram, like what kind of experience my followers have at the airport. And most of them said they had horrible experience. And, and I find that should, yeah, that should definitely change. And I also used to work at the airport when I was a student. <laughs> I did a lot of jobs. You've done everything. <laughs> so uh, I was working as a um, um, stewardess, like I was doing onboarding and so on. And what surprised me was when we, when we did the course, uh, we had some examples, like when you check a passport and so on. And the example they showed us was like from Black people. <laughs> and nobody found it wrong. And I was like, why do you have to show like a real passport from a black person? Why can't you just say like, okay, 
like fake passport can exist and so on. Um, and uh, mostly like uh, BPOC like had really issues when they entered the country. I mean, even when I was working, I remember one guy had a passport from uh, Burma, I think it was Burma. And my colleague thought he's not allowed to UK without visa, but they are allowed, but he had like a, a lot of prejudice. So he thought, no, no, he can't, probably he's not allowed because he's somehow, he was a bit, like, a bit darker, you know, so most of them are not allowed to, to go to UK anyway without passports. So he doesn't have a Schengen visa. So I was like, I was not sure. So we called the supervisor um, and he was really angry. And, and yeah, so that happens a lot. Yeah. And I hope um, there is, like, not, let's say, to initiate somehow a change. I don't know how, but that's definitely one of my vision. Yeah. You know, what's interesting um, for me is that listening to you talk about, you know, the amount of people that have also, that have had really negative experiences in airports. I'm, I wasn't surprised, but a little bit I was because, you know, from my perspective, it's, it's like you were saying earlier about, you know, intersectionality having so many, like there's so many different ways that someone can be intersectional, right? And mm -hmm. I often forget about my American privilege and the fact that we can go pretty much anywhere without needing any kind of special visas or anything like that. But mm -hmm. I was also thinking about one of my first trips had to have been back from Germany because I think I was flying Lufthansa and of course it is a German airline. And so as someone who can speak German, you know, I'm really excited to keep speaking German right up until I get back to the United States. But, you know, coming onto the plane as they're greeting you, you hear them speaking German to everybody until they get to you. And then they say, you know, good morning in English or something. I'm like, but I'm still in Germany. Why are we speaking English? It's this. And I know that it's this. However, I thought to myself, I'm going to ask anyway. I'm going to ask one of them because they kept doing it as they were, you know, offering beverages, snacks, and that kind of thing. So eventually I did ask somebody, why are you speaking English to me? In German, of course, I'm asking them, why did you choose to speak English to me? And um, the flight attendant said that they kind of just do it based on a, a feeling. And I was like, I don't know what that means. What, like, how do you feel that I speak English? I could very well be a native German speaker, you know? And so mm -hmm. the work that I do on, you know, looking at racism in children's literature and that kind of thing, it's for this reason. It's so that the children that come to your Black Joy, Black Joy bike parade, um, you know, that they will eventually one day not have to keep running into white Germans who think that they don't speak German, right? Or that they're just not from Germany at all somehow, right? So, um, yeah. That is, uh, there are different different levels <laughs> to racism and uh, how people experience it. But that is, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a lot. By the way, that question was not so much a hypothetical question about working with institutions. I happen to know the person who asked it and she works at a university. So be looking out for an email. <laughs> ah, nice. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm going to read this because it's a little long and I don't think I can summarize it very quickly. But this person mm -hmm. says, the racism in Berlin seems... Um, as a white person, pretty intense. A lot of my black friends have left Germany to other countries. Where are some good spaces that I can refer those who remain to find community? Besides the fabulous tours, obviously, which I look forward to checking out once I can scratch together any currency. Oh, <laughs> thank you. So yeah, I mean, the thing is, you, you're definitely right. It's quite intense in Berlin, I would also say. Um, I had a different experience in Frankfurt, I must say, and I was quite shocked when I moved to Berlin. So I guess it also depends where you move around. So when you, I had the feeling like there is like an invisible wall within Berlin. You have the west and the east part. Mm -hmm. And I had the feeling like the west side of Berlin is mostly like um, liberal. Um, and the east part of Berlin is quite tough. So you also see a lot of um, like indigenous, like East Berliners who are really struggling to survive. So for them, every foreigner is something bad or they have a lot of prejudice, you know, 
and it's quite difficult. So I, I definitely understand why a lot of people also leave um, the city. And um, Berliners are also not really friendly. So you don't really have a service industries like people are, I mean, if they know you, they can be nice as well. You can have a good and a bad experience. And I think it also depends when you move to Berlin. If you come to Berlin, it's very tough in winter. In summer, it's quite nice. <laughs> um, but now um, a lot of, um, let's say, people community have their own spaces you have on facebook for example black berlin um where you can um, get a lot of advice and you will find many black people from around the world that stayed in berlin that have um, like that have their own family um some of them also lived here for like several generations like the family Dieck, for example um so it depends what you want in berlin so you have the uh, big LGBT community, um, you have the Maghreb community, um, so it depends. But I totally understand why people want to leave Berlin as well. So it's definitely tough. But if you also need some advice, I can definitely also help you. I mean, I can post my email address. Yeah. That would be great. And also um, on... Sudi's website, I know that there are a couple of blog posts that Mia Pham has. Um, and I think the most recent yeah. one is about um, how to discover more of Black Berlin. And so that might be helpful for, you know, the finding community, community or finding safe spaces for people. Yeah, because I know yeah. one of the places you, I think is the Yoto Library. Um, Yoto oh, stands yeah. for each one, teach one. And um, so mm -hmm. it is, it's like, a, it's like a community center that also has a library that um, boasts the collection of literature from Black authors, not all Black German authors, but also Black American, Black British authors, um, African authors as well, um, Black African authors. And so, yeah, so you might find some tips in there or contact Miriam directly. And uh, yeah, there are places. Um, also, they just a little update. Um, apparently, other white people have also been profiled by Lufthansa, <laughs> so it's not just me. Um, apparently one can also look American. Um, so I don't think that I seemed overly friendly, but perhaps I did. And perhaps that is also why I was spoken to in English. I think overall we should all maybe agree or can all agree that it would be nice to speak German in Germany because that's where one does that. <laughs> all right. Yes, um, I don't know if I see any other, I don't think I see any other questions i'll give a few seconds just in case there are some last minute ones or oliver if you had any questions or um thoughts that you wanted to share before we start to wrap this up oh a lot of thoughts but um i think we're good in time so it's a good time to to wrap this up although there is one question coming in right now maybe we take that more about historical Love figures. To hear more about historical figures. Yeah. You have to go on the tour, I think. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but I can definitely uh, name some of them, like the historical figures. Uh, okay. For example, uh, Gustav Sabach Alcher. Wait, let me show you um, a picture of him. Um, maybe I will just share my screen, then everybody can see it. Um, he, for example, is actually um, Wasch Echter Berliner, so um, an Afro-German military, military officer um, during the First World War. And I find this, his, this part of history is quite impressive for me to find out because his father was a uh, Kamadina, so he came from Sudan. He was, uh, he was, nah, it's actually, nah, yeah, the back history is not so nice. So he came as a, as a present from the Osman kingdom to the Prussia kingdom. Um, he, like Gustav Sabah Asher, and this is his son who uh, 
well, yeah, basically was born and raised in Germany in Berlin, became a military officer, very famous one. And um, it's basically a, a German history. And uh, you can also buy the book um, and you will find out more about the family history. And it's like a fifth or sixth generation uh, German. I mean, now it, I mean, they're con like his grand grandchildren are completely white. <laughs> so you wouldn't really think they had a, a grand grandfather who was black. Uh, but it's really interesting because um, one of his sons um, were also fighting during the Nazi time, so they were Nazis. So it's quite impressive to find out about this part of history as well. Um, so yeah, the Black people in Germany are actually quite connected to the African continent. And you also have um, Familie Dieck. see this is the exhibition they also are Bach Echter Berliner so lived in Berlin for more than five generations um that's Abena that's her mother also fifth even sixth generation now yeah. and um she she also came into to my bike parade and that's mm -hmm. also quite impressive because even Germans will, are shocked when they find out and what made me sad was that she told me uh, when the war, uh, when the Berliner Wall fall, she said she was scared because uh, she was perceived from East Berlin as, as a foreigner and she was insulted on the street and so on because they thought she was not German, she was migrant, but her family lived for more than five generations. So not even German, bio-Germans <laughs> are German like her, I would say. Yeah. So yeah, it's quite interesting, actually. Um, there One are more than that, actually. Your, uh, your comment huh? just now, Miriam, to um, your comment to how, how long a history yeah. certain families have had in Berlin or in Germany yeah, yeah, is yeah. really fascinating because you're absolutely right you do not think about um I, I don't know how much people consider like generationally what it means to be german or or any nationality right there's this phrase that is used a lot or it, it's politically correct the phrase right um what is it um migration hintergrund a person with a migration yeah, yeah. history. I, I remember when I like the first time that I'd heard that and how you know confused I was because I was like, when does when does your migration history or your migration past end in your family? Like how many generations are you considered to be a migrant or a migrant family? Mm, true. I mean, I also wanted to show this one because you used as a, a poster. So I thought I should definitely say that as well. Uh, this is Martin de Bouvet. He uh, was, he's also Afro-German um, with Cameroonian background. He was the first black um, um, train driver in Germany. And he made a career in Germany, actually, even though he had a lot of, um, it was not, it was quite hard on that time. And uh, he was also exhibited as a, as a, like an object when he was a child, let's say a teenager. So you can imagine how far he went. And he was an activist as well. So um, very interesting person as well. And before we end, maybe I actually wanted to um, also say something that uh, what that also impressed me when I came to Berlin is that uh, Martin Luther King was also in Berlin, you probably know. And um, he was invited by the mayor, uh, Willy Brandt at that time in the 60s. And he came actually to West Berlin um, to celebrate Church Day and to also mourn um, Kennedy's, um, like because he died. Um, but he was also invited to East part of Berlin and he was not allowed to go there. Because, and he, um, American soldier also took his passport away, um, but he persisted and he went to East part of Berlin. And um, at the gate of Cheikh Bonchali, um, the soldiers asked him, like, uh, why do you want to go there first? And 
uh, who is this person? And they check, ah, okay. And they, they remembered him, even though he was from, even though they were from the East. Mm -hmm. And he showed them his American Express card. <laughs> <laughs> and they let him in, which is funny because in East Berlin, American Express card, it's it's like really interesting. And that was quite interesting for me. And two weeks ago, I found out through EOTO um, that um, American GIs in the 60s were smuggling East Germans to West Berlin mm. uh, to free them from the Arist, like from like, yeah, they were a lot of people were already um migrating illegally from East Berlin to West Berlin, to like to West Germany. And some soldiers were also helping them to do so. And I find that quite interesting and impressive as well. And you can find out about that history actually uh, on Ebony magazine. It went it was published on in the 60s as well. <laughs> yeah. So quite impressive. Yeah, a lot more uh, history and a lot more connections, like American German connections, to be made for sure. Um, oh, for yeah. Um, if you have another uh, person to present, that is perfectly fine. We can also do that. I want to point out just because I've seen it a few times in the chat um, that absolutely anti-black racism is not the only type of racism that there is to be talked about in Germany or Berlin specifically. Oh, yeah. um, absolutely, there is anti-Asian discrimination and hate as well. Um, so we're not at all trying to you know, discount that, erase that. Um, that just happens to not be my area of expertise. I do hope that one day we will be mm -hmm. able to integrate um, those into the programming as well or create you know, new programming for such conversations. But I just wanted to you know, make it very clear that I am seeing that those, those um, comments as well, and that is absolutely true that that exists too. Also, um, if Miriam has another one, before I before I hand it back to you, I wanna let you know that I am also now posting in the chat um, a link for the registration to Amende de Revolution, which Oliver mentioned at the very beginning will be March 8th and 9th at Push Push Theater in Atlanta. Um, it is, yes, it is there now. And um, I think that it is, uh, $10 per ticket or donation based. It, it is both of those things. So um, please come if you can, tell somebody else if you can come or not come. And that is the end of those announcements. Miriam, did you have anything else that you wanna share with us? Uh, there are, I mean, a lot more, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. I think you have to join, uh, you have to come to Berlin. Uh, I guess, um, but yeah, if you have questions, you can definitely also write me via email and I'm happy to, yeah, sh to share my insight with you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Is there a place where such a ratio is achieved? What ratio? I'm sorry. I just noticed that and I don't know what ratio is meant. Hmm? Uh, HP, would you like to clarify? Ah, okay. I heard there's a percentage of representation that one must see in a space in order to feel or to not feel tokenized. Um, yeah, I understand the concern. Um, it, yes, um, I think uh -huh. at this point, for me personally, my opinion on um, the race, like ratios of representation, um, I think it might not be. Hmm. I don't want to say this. I think that there. I think that it's important for where we are right now. I think for a lot of countries, it's important to overcompensate. It's my personal feel on it. For me, I don't think that a ratio is necessarily enough. Just because um, you're right, you might, you still might not see enough of you. And I think that we have a lot of work to do to correct, um, to correct colonialism, to correct racism. And I think that there's an aggressive way to do that, to make it happen faster and in a way that such that people won't feel like they're being tokenized. True, but I must say that um, that the one million Afro-German is also, we are more than that because um, migrants were not, for example, my parents, my mom, um, they were not, let's say, because 
you know, German, Germany has a really weird system of like people with migration background and then you have migrants and then you have uh, refugees and so on. So it's actually quite difficult to get the numbers. So I definitely would also say we are more than 1 million um, because the 1 million are actually Afro-Germans. So second or first generation migrants or mixed race. So yeah, so that way it's quite difficult to also really say, okay, how, how many we are. And uh, you also have a different, um, so it's not like US, that's also the thing where people also mix everything sometimes because the difficulties we have in Germany is also that um, a lot of um, systematic problems are being, um, let's say, um, exported from US to Germany. Uh, but Germany has a really different relation to race. Uh, of course, we definitely also learned a lot through US, um, but we have a huge migrant community and the migrant community don't really, let's say the second generation is changing, but um, most of them also, first of all, didn't really saw them, see themselves as black first. Um, it, it's mostly like ethnic based um, community, uh, religion based community. So it's also really difficult to like, see like, okay, now it's changing now a lot of, let's say the kids are seeing themselves as black people, but in the past it was like more about like, no, I'm Ghanaian, no, I'm Eritrean, no, I'm Congolese, no, I'm from the Caribbean, for example. And then you also have um, the different system that also create a lot of imbalance, like the West Germany and East Germany and West German, for, for example, um, African-Americans were really treated really, really well, where African migrants were treated like shit. So you, you had like a huge imbalance there as well. So to be an African-American was really cool. Even when I grew up in Frankfurt, everybody wanted to be African-American. <laughs> so even Africans took like African-American names Everybody, like from starting from uh, Morocco to Ethiopia to Ghana, Congo, everywhere was everyone was African American. Because if you say you're African, you're like, oh, okay, you're a refugee or something else. Whether in the East, it was like um, people came to East Germany because they wanted to study. So they came from um, mostly like Tanzania, Angola, Mozambique, but also Cuba. Um, and they also, they really had issues living in East Germany, but the problem with East Germany was that they say we are equal, even though there was like race uh, issues. So they were treated badly, but it, you couldn't really communicate it because they, they told you we are the same. Um, and people were killed. There was um, um, uh, an Angoli Angolian, student, for example, in Eberswalde, who was killed by the Nazis in the 90s. So you had a lot of incidents, but it was difficult to communicate. But then through the you, American influence, especially with George Floyd, mm. uh, I would say, started the, like the, the Black community in Germany started to also shout and say, okay, it's not only a US problem, we also have a problem here in Germany. Absolutely. And that is actually um, the inability to communicate that there are racial issues is something that in my work, you know, I talk about a lot because of the fact that, you know, post Holocaust, Germany mm. working its way back onto the world stage necessarily meant that, you know, they needed to atone for, you know, for being racist, which also resulted in just not talking about race. <laughs> you know, it resulted in announcing kind of like, we're, we're past this, we've healed from this, or, you know, we're healing from this. Um, but, you know, just kind of removing, even today, like I still am confused, right? Like I still don't know what words to use in German because we don't use, um, because the word race isn't used, right? Like in, in its former, usage like they don't have it today and I think I've seen race like R A capital R-A-C-E um but it doesn't 
it's it's like you said, like it kind of has more of an American association. And so it's easy to kind of um, kind of have this idea of like racism as being like exported, right? Or imported rather into Germany. Like it's it's a problem somewhere else. Mm -hmm. It's not our problem. And that does make it extremely difficult to talk about when you literally don't have the language to address it. Oh yeah. And I would also say um, that in like the institution is also really, really um, racist. Um, and that's, I, I think also the problem where people assume it's okay because it's in like it's in the institution so if you see for example um how many difficulties people have when moving to berlin it's insane because everything has to be german if you go to institution to, for example when you want to move your apartment for example you have to register right but in order to <laughs> have another apartment you have to go to bürgeramt but Bürgeramt, everybody speaks in, Eng in German. <laughs> so they don't even try because they think it's not, I mean, of course, it's like it's the institution that's the problem. Um, so people don't really assume it's, it's wrong because it's, it's the institution that's tell them, no, you have to speak German uh, at Bürgeramt. I mean, now it's also changing, but, and that's how it is, like the whole system is, it's very like very strict and and it doesn't really allow you to like flourish and um and then it it has like a, a huge system okay uh, refugees are not allowed to work uh, but then um people blame refugees that um they're not working but they can't work they're not allowed to work so what are you so it's 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 like it's the system and that's also yeah. that that's, and and you also have the imbalance between east and west, so it's like a hierarchy. Like um, um, it's a hierarchy, but people don't really want to say that. Actually, we we can say it here because it's true. <laughs> so that's okay. Yeah, definitely. Also just to clarify, um, yeah. <laughs> with the the question of ratio representation based on ratio, that person actually meant more so like in real life. And to that question, which is a much simpler question to my mind. I don't I don't know if there will be, you know, if there will be anytime soon the opportunity to see, you know, lots of representation in any particular place. Um, it's really interesting because even in Berlin where, you know, there are, where there is a concentration of Black people, when I live there, the times that I've lived there, it is on the one hand, like I know that there are, you know, millions of people that look like me, that look like us. And on the other hand, even in such a place, it is still very, um, it's it's like, it'll make your day to see someone else black. I don't know about you, Mia Fiam, but I definitely try to make eye contact and give a head nod because I just want to, you know, make that connection because it feels nice. True. And the funny thing is also that Berliners think that Berlin is multicultural, but what they mean is it's multicultural, uh let's say within Europe you know <laughs> mm. but it doesn't mean if you go to London for example you will definitely um see the difference of course I would also say that Frankfurt Hamburg like Stuttgart are more diverse than mm. Berlin Berlin is actually now changing so 10 years ago you had less um black people I didn't really see uh, many actually no so it's changing yeah and i think you're right i mean i was thinking about so my first time doing study abroad in berlin was actually 2010 uh, to 2011 and so i think you're absolutely right i didn't see as many black people back then as i do now and now it is interesting that when i do see younger people it's just like what you said about um you know your the different parts of their identity like having different weight it doesn't seem now that they that the young people, the young black people that I see, it doesn't seem like they tend to uh, relate to the world as a black person so much as a German person. They seem a lot more connected to their Germanness, to my mind, to, to what I see than to their blackness, which I think sure. is, is progress, you know? Like it's, if you feel, um, if you feel whole, if you feel comfortable, you know, as, as a black German, but, more um 
more as a German. Does that make sense? I don't think I'm expressing this really well, but um, I think that it's great that they are seeing themselves as German first. True. Yeah. I mean, it depends, right? It's definitely changing. We also have representation uh, in, in the parliament now. We have three politicians. And, and that's like quite huge, I would say, because if you compare it with France or Italy, I would say Germany is definitely jumping, not marathon, but it's like <laughs> a huge change. And I can also imagine that for a lot of people, it's quite a lot. And I can see that um, because you have like the majority who is also quite open and who is also open to make mistakes, to also like learn from their mistakes. Um, but then you also have people um, that are like in shock. That's like too much change for them. And sure. I can see that at work as well. So it's, <laughs> so yeah, people are trying. So it's not, not everything is bad. So uh, I mean, I can see the change and it makes me also happy. Uh, this year, for example, um, the um, foreign, um, um, let's say office, which they used to call it Aus Ausländerbehörde. And mm. now they change it to um, like Willkommensbehörde, which is quite huge. <laughs> I would say, uh, because they want to symbolize, okay, we want to welcome people, because in the past, it was like Ausländer Behörde, it was like nobody oh. wanted to go there, it was like yeah. foreign, <laughs> and uh, people were like scared to go, yeah. and even my parents, I remember my mom, uh, because she didn't have a German passport, and every time she had a letter from Ausländer Behörde, it was like a heart attack, it's like, oh my god, what do they want for me now? <laughs> It's true. <laughs> but that's, that's the experience a lot of people have with the institutions. Like every time a letter comes from whatever, from tax or, yeah, it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> it feels yeah, like I no, did something wrong again. <laughs> it does feel that way. I don't know why it feels more that way in Germany than it does here, but I also have had a similar feel. <laughs> and I think that it is also really important to know, you know, the difference in changing, you know, the name from the outside Ausländer Behörde to, um, I think I've also seen it, the Landesamt für Einwanderung or something like that. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it is important to change the name. It gives, it, it, it absolutely has a different connotation to it, right? So yeah, again, mm -hmm. to the point of language being really important. Um, there is a quick question about German, the German stare. <laughs> How do you deal with this? Um, for those who have not been to Germany, who don't, who are not aware, Germans like to stare. They will just look they will look and not say anything um and i having experienced this uh during my first study abroad here uh, i do remember feeling very uncomfortable and i remember feeling very um targeted you know and very very odd about having somebody stare at me but i was also much younger than i was 10 years younger than and i just stare back now that's how i react um I have also once or twice recently just flat out asked somebody what it is that they are looking at. At least one of those times, someone was actually just trying to read my sweatshirt. So it was a good thing that I asked. Um, I my sweatshirt also happened to say, all Black Lives Matter, just in case you were wondering. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so yeah, that's how I handle it. Miriam, how do you handle the Germans there? I'm used to it somehow. Sometimes it's I mean, for me, it's the other way around. For example, the first um, experience I had where I thought like, oh, it's different was uh, when I went to London or school, I was like, wow, okay, people are really different. Nobody's staring me. And I've, I saw like many people doing uh, several jobs, like people with um, like in a banking and you could see like people like from different backgrounds. I also saw a, uh, a bus driver with hijab and I was like wow I never saw something like that in Germany but then when my cousin came from US from Chicago she was like what is this why are people staring at me all the time and I was like yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's how it is people stare and then yeah. sometimes you can stare back yeah, but I, guess I would like to say that. Just, um, I would curious. like to say that often you curious. can stare back. Yeah, 
Yeah, well, you can stare back and, I think and people also are curious. be curious. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think people are curious and I guess, um, yeah, maybe it's, it's also different because for most of the people, um, yeah, they never, like for many, it's like the first time they see a black person or a, I don't know, I just feel sometimes because it depends as well, right? So it depends on the experience, but yeah, you're right, people really stare a lot. People do stare a lot. And I think that you're absolutely right. You know, it is the case that most of the time people are just curious. Maybe you also have never, maybe that person has never seen a black person before. It's very possible, mm. very possible. But I think that, you know, what makes it so uncomfortable is the the brazenness, is the, you know, the the right that you feel to to just to to stay. You know, it's it's there's a difference, I think, what I'm trying to say is between looking and staring. <laughs> you know so anyway that's how we handle it um mm -hmm. yeah so i am gonna go ahead and say a last couple of things um first i know that um because miriam does a lot of the work for Tsudi herself i know that there is a need if if, if it's okay to say that for you know for there to be financial support um, and so if you wouldn't mind me, I think I'm typing into the chat where people can support you if they would like to, um, so that you can continue to do things like the Black Joy Bike Parade, which I do secretly hope happens in 2023, even though I won't oh, be in Berlin. Oh. And if it doesn't, I definitely hope to be able to join you next year or the year after. But yeah, so please let us know how we can um, support you. I think it's also listed on the Goethe Atlanta um, on the registration page for this event that it is listed somewhere in the description and on the Facebook page as well. Um, yeah, so if there are no further questions, I'm gonna thank you again, Miriam, for joining us. Thank you, Oliver, for thank supporting you. this event and Sabina as well, I know you're still here. Um, and yeah, that is it for me. Thank you again. I would like to thank both of you for this insightful or informative discussion. That's really, I think, those of us who are German, we learn a little bit something, if it's only the steering, but I think not only that. <laughs> and um, for everyone else, I hope it was also an insightful event that actually triggered at least three ideas already for follow-up events in my mind. So <laughs> <laughs> this is not going to be the last time we meet each other. Oh, thanks. And I, I will definitely, in case I'm, I will be in Atlanta, maybe we can meet in person. Who knows? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Great rest of the Maybe we can. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> if everybody wants to turn on the camera for joint oh, yeah, goodbye that would be waving. So. Yeah. That would be nice. I know some of you will not be courageous enough, but <laughs> I think that would be nice. It's always because I know the feeling. It's like you talk into the void sometimes. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Danke auch. Thank you too. See you in our merch events and maybe in Berlin. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.